Okay, I will now call the May 18th work session of Lane Community College Board of Education meeting to order. Um, Donna, could you please take the roll? Sure. Holly Johnson. Present. Angela Van Kraus. Present. Mike Eister. Here. Austin Polnagy. Here. Steve Mattel. I'm here. Lisa Fragula. Present. Rosie Pryor. Here. Great, everybody is accounted for. Um, the board opens our meeting with an acknowledgement that the meeting place, the meeting takes place on the traditional homeland of the Kalapuya. And tonight, AVP Grant Matthews is going to read the acknowledgement of homeland. Thank you. We begin our meeting with the acknowledgement that the land we are on is the traditional homeland of the Kalapuya people. The Kalapuya were stewards of this very land for over 14,000 years before their traditional way of life was forever disrupted and destroyed. We start our meeting with humility and reverence for the original inhabitants, the Kalapuya. I believe that as we take this moment to recognize this land and the Kalapuya people, it is also appropriately appropriate to quietly acknowledge the continued tragedies of war in Ukraine and the horrific racially motivated gun violence in Buffalo and reflect on our personal and institutional responsibilities to recognize our own biases and help overcome racism and prejudice. Thank you, Grant. All right, so let's go ahead and adopt the agenda. I'd like to adopt the agenda with flexibility um, without objection. Are there any objections to adop adopting the agenda with flexibility? Okay, seeing none, we've adopted the agenda. <laughs> and just going to note that Austin is here in um, the Zoom room with us and to, to remind people to please try to use a microphone um, so that anybody viewing this meeting virtually can, can hear you. Our first discussion item tonight is the iTech programs. And I'm going to let Grant tell us what iTech is, including the acronym. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Fragala, members of the board, and President Hamilton for the opportunity this evening to present on the Industry and Trades Education Center. <clears throat> Provided in, in um, board docs, you should have received um, a brief uh, document, a white paper, talking a little bit about the project, as well as the slides that I have available for, for this evening. I don't know if we're going to be able to have those up or not um, as, we, as we move forward. Um, and then also an executive summary from uh, one of our national partners that I'll be referencing during the presentation. <clears throat> so as you asked, you know, what is the iTech? Well, the iTech is the Industry and Trades Education Center. And this, um, I'm very excited to talk about this project. Uh, this really is the iteration or the, the, the current iteration of what started as the Building 12 renovation and the investment in our trades education and our um, advanced manufacturing and advanced trades um, areas. And as I, I start, I want to uh, really recognize and thank that the team that I've been working with on this project from the beginning, um, Senior Instructional Dean uh, Chris Wren has been a pivotal member in helping um, bring this project forward and talk to the, the faculty and others about uh, the needs that we have also, Theo Davis with the Capital Construction Crew has worked hard to bring this project forward. And I think every now and then you've heard a little bit from Tom. Tom Goodhue's been partially involved with this project every now and then. <laughs> no, he's been a, a pivotal part of that. And then also really recognize, um, you know, the architects that we've been working with, Henneberry Eddy Architects. They have truly captured some of the vision that we set out at the beginning of being collaborative and talking to our stakeholders and taking that to a really extensive level in their conversations with us and with the groups as they've talked about the design of this, of this building. So <clears throat> a little bit about iTech. So if we'll move to the next slide, you know, the question comes up, why iTech? Why invest in an industry and trades education center building? And really, when we look at our current job market, you know, oh, about 50% of the jobs in Oregon uh, require a skills training. 
Now, this is different than a university training and very much different than a high school education. These are that in-between area of, of one um, more than high school, but less than four-year degree training programs, which really are what community colleges do best and really are invested in providing. That's an incredible number of jobs in our communities that require this type of training. We also expect growth in manufacturing, trades, and construction between three and 9% over the next several years. And those numbers, you know, with given the current economy are changing um, every day. But there's also projected about a 220,000 a new house start in the next decade in Oregon that is projected as well, which also drives our construction and other trades industries. As we, you know, as you probably are aware from the news and elsewhere, there are labor shortages that are going on in our state and others. And many of the areas that they are looking for are areas in advanced technology, trades, apprenticeship, and other areas that are, are direct sectors that impact our communities. Another reason why we're looking at investments in this area is as we look across the state, you know, the, the governor and, and the legislature recently passed the Future Ready Oregon initiative, which provides an immense amount, about $200 million of investment directly into areas like advanced manufacturing, construction, cybersecurity, other areas that this state is, is looking at investing in. And so being ready to take advantage of these funds requires that we have the facilities in order to participate in those training trainings and provide them to our students. And then I think another reason why this is so important at this point in time is that when we look at the history of the institution, this is probably one of the first or the most significant investment in our trades and apprenticeships on campus since the 1970s, really when the campus started. So this is a, an opportunity for us to reinvest in these areas that really have been pivotal parts of our community and part of our campus um, instruction for a very long time. If we delve a little bit more deeply and just talk about manufacturing, some of the state data that talks about manufacturing and advanced manufacturing, we're looking at about 11,000, 12,000 vacancies um, that, that took place in the summer of 21. And again, this was pre this kind of real surge in employment that is there. In manufacturing alone, we're looking at an 11% increase over the next couple of, over the next decade or less than decade. And you know, one of the more interesting parts is that when we look at these sectors, the average or median wages are significant. These are family wage jobs that we are preparing students to participate in that really make a difference for our communities. Other parts that are important are, important are that our, our community, part, our business partners are telling us that these positions, they're having a difficult time to fill these positions 76% of the time. And frequently that is because of a skills gap. They are facing skills gap with their workers that they're needing to fill. The other one is that's really interesting when we talk about our apprenticeship programs is about 50% of the jobs that are being asked right now in this sector are requiring some type of work experience. And this is where our apprenticeship programs really shine is being able to provide students work experience while they're in training so that they can fulfill those requirements as they're working towards full employment in other as they as they graduate and finish their programs. So now kind of the more exciting part. All right, so this is that's the why. Why are we doing this? So now what are we hoping to accomplish with the iTech building? What are we hoping to accomplish in an industry and trades education center? Well, as I mentioned before, this, is, this project started as the renovation of Building 12. And so some of the programming that we're looking at in this building is looking to replace space that will be lost from Building 12. So programs that were currently scheduled in, in Building 12. But it also provides an opportunity for us to make new investments or to look at the changes in our workforce and start to address those. So again, we're looking at in this building, providing space for many of our apprenticeship programs and our apprenticeship labs for them to be able to collaborate and work and have their didactic classes. We're looking at putting construction in this building along with our machining program in the machine shop. We're then also looking at investing in new areas around advanced manufacturing, automation, robotics, kind of what is known as this industry 4.0 or I 4.0. 
We're also looking at including in this building an unmanned aircraft systems lab and our fabrication lab. And when we talked about this building and we really started to think about what was going in here, one of the priorities that we named very early on was the ability for programs to collaborate with each other and really find synergies of how they can mimic industry. And this really led to some of the reasons why we wanted to put the unmanned aircraft systems and a fabrication lab into this building, because these are groups that utilize many of the same techniques, equipment, and processes that are used in advanced manufacturing, in welding and fabrication, and other things. And by locating the building as we moved to a new construction, by locating the building near the fabrication and welding lab, and near the arts building and near to our automotive and diesel labs, we're able to kind of start to create a CTE district, that these programs will be able to come together and collaborate on projects and curriculum, sharing equipment and having these synergies. And, and, and just as an example, you know, when we talk to some of our, our major industry partners like Johnson Crushers, Aztec and others, in their shops, they have machinists working alongside welding and fabricators to produce the products that they're making for industries. Well, this is an ideal situation for now our students in the machining program to be able to see what's going on in the welding and fabrication area and know what it's going to be like if they go out and get a job in a similar shop that is having to do this. Similarly, our unmanned aircraft systems are going to be able to walk into the machine shop and see the equipment that other areas for fast prototyping use for creating systems or, or aircraft systems. And we're going to be able to kind of help mirror that and have student projects that do that. The other thing that this allowed was an opportunity for a more accessibility on campus by having this building that kind of connects the higher part of campus down with our lower parts of campus on that eastern side. So a question that I get frequently is, you know, how, who has been participating in the kind of development and thought process that is going on within the iTech building and this whole design and, and build? We've been working closely with some of our national partners, such as the National Coalition of Advanced Technology Centers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about them in just a second. But in addition to that, we've been working with Lane ESD, some of our other local business and partners, such as the Lane Workforce Partnership, talking about what our industries are looking like, what our partner agencies need, what our businesses need. We've also done benchmarking visits to um, the Omic Center and PC at Portland Community College, our partners at Chemeketa and Lynn Benton. We've also visited places like Pima Community College that are investing heavily in their advanced technology centers as well. We've also joined with consortia around the state that are looking at these advanced manufacturing fields. And one of the areas that I'm really happy about, the uh, group that has really stepped up are our joint apprenticeship um, committees, um, training committees. These JATCs you know, are deeply integrated with the apprenticeship um, groups and really provide a lot of advice. And they've really participated a lot in our conversations about what this building can look like, what it can do, how we can build connections between our construction program, our machining program, and apprenticeship activities that are going on. And that's helping us be able to design the space in a, in a real meaningful way in that way. We've also been able to really partner with faculty and staff on the designs and that. You know, when we talk about, um, I mentioned before that we have partnered with a national partner, the National Coalition of Advanced Technology Centers. Very early on in the project, we knew that we wanted to recognize what was going on in our community and what was going on nationally. We brought in the foremost expert on advanced technology centers with Craig McAtee and one of his board members, Jeff Wyko. And they came in and helped us provide 15 90 minute interviews over three days with our local businesses, industries, and other partners. Now, I must say that, you know, I, I, I shouldn't be surprised, you know, when we were able to um, thankfully and successfully pass a bond during the middle of a pandemic, you know, our community really showed what is important to them. 
They showed it again when we held these, um, this member assistance program. They showed up in droves. You know, we, we invited about 418 individuals to come and participate and more than 219 came and attended. And that attendance meant dedicating 90 minutes of their time to sit and talk and participate in these sessions. That's, an ex that's a significant um, investment. And our participation rate was over was 52% of the overall participants that we invited. That exceeds most surveys that take two to three seconds to, to participate in as far as turnout. <laughs> We had over 153 organizations and businesses represented within those, those individuals who shared their voices and shared their concerns, shared their ideas and dreams for what we could do with the center. And we're talking, we had CEOs from major companies in the area like Seneca and Arkimoto who participated and other major companies and partners that participated. And we were very thankful for that. They provided for us uh, through this process NCATC was able to hear what they were talking about, hear what their concerns were, and bring to us about 20 general recommendations and 14 program and curricular recommendations that we've been able to consider and look at and really contemplate as we've moved forward with our design considerations, as well as our investments in curriculum and what programming would go into this building. When I look at the highlights from this NCATC visit, you know, as they talked to our community members, as they discussed what needs existed and what the future looked like for advanced technology centers in this curriculum, they identified a recommended baseline of about 76,000 square feet for a construction or renovation. They recommended looking at an investment of between five and $8 million over the next several years for equipment for new and existing programs. And as they looked at future programming opportunities, they identified about $7.5 million in new program investments that we could make in areas that they saw emerging from our community, such as Industry 4.0, as smaller businesses are starting to delve into that area and look to the future of how they accomplish their work. They also recommended that we start exploring what's known as a built or a business and industry-led uh, leadership team to really be able to make sure that the industry voices on a continual basis are involved in the curriculums that we're developing and the way that we're utilizing the equipment and space in those centers. And so I really thank the, the community for stepping up and coming and talking to us. And we've been able to glean an immense amount of information from that as we've put together our plan for the industry and trades um, education center. And I'm you know, this is an exciting project for me and for the campus, and I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have about it. Thank you very much, Grant. Are there any questions um, from board members? Steve? Thanks for the presentation. That was great. Uh, this is exciting stuff. I love it. Uh, yes. So yeah, don't, I, depend, don't read any question I have as, <laughs> uh, you know, opposition. It's not um, at all. Uh, in any case, I'm wondering, if um, you are, when you're out there talking with the local businesses and such, whether there are sponsorship type discussions going on, like hey, that whether they would be interested not only in, in receiving the benefit of, but investing in um, some piece or part of the, the building or the equipment that's being recommended for our students to train on that kind of thing. Yeah, that's definitely a, a conversation that we try and have. And it's also a conversation that we've had with the foundation and starting to talk about what we can do in a more formalized manner in that way. You know, when I look at a lot of our trades areas, um, there's a lot of participation already from many of those businesses and many of those partners. Our welding and fabrication center um, labs recently had um, just an incredible donation from a local community member of, I think three new, very expensive pieces of equipment that they've been needing for a very long time. Some of those same businesses are working with the students to provide weekend work as they're participating in the program so that they can have an, you know, employment kind of while they're finishing the program and doing different investments like that. So um, another area, our diesel um, tech program is another one that has a very active advisory committee that 
has um, been very successful in talking to donors about those needs. And so this is definitely a, an area that we continue to have conversations. And we also continue to have some pretty incredible donors that do provide resources. Um, I do hope that that's something that we can step up and really talk to additional businesses about and include them in um, the needs that we have. As we look at building out the iTech Center, there will be many equipment needs that we have moving into that space. And I hope that we are able to um, talk specifically about what those needs are with businesses and ask them to step up and help us with it. Yeah, it just seems like a real opportunity for the yeah. foundation to partner with us if they aren't already to, um, to step up that, that relationship. Yep. Yeah. Austin in the queue, all by myself. Excellent. I uh, actually have two questions, but first, a uh, great presentation. And I really like the concept of a CTE district. Uh, you and I have had conversations about a higher education uh, corridor, and uh, I re I re but I really like that name, the CTE district there. Uh, my first question, um, so obviously the location of the building is obviously really important. And I was just kind of wondering the proximity of it uh, for like our GED students, our international students, our student population in general, kind of like to kind of create a, um, uh, essentially a funnel towards uh, the iTech uh, building and facilities, um, both in a, uh, um, in a uh, organizational um, um, concept, but also in a, um, um, a functional building concept. Can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, you know, this was a, a, a topic of a lot of conversation during our design process. And um, one of the things that we, we really talked about was when we look at lot N, the parking lot that is lot N, it's one of our largest parking lots and it's also one of the most used parking lots. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, <clears throat> it, as you saw from some of the designs that were in the slides, one of the priorities that we had as we identified the lot M location for the building one of our main priorities was making sure that that building visually and physically connected that lower and upper part of campus so that students coming from lot N down what will become kind of a CTE boulevard, right? Right through that <laughs> middle, right through the middle of that district would have the opportunity to go right into the iTech building and up into the main functions that are there or over into the arts building in building 10 in those areas or continue on to the center of campus through those pathways that are, are there. And so, you know, we do have a reality on our campus that we have, a, uh, we have, we are fortunate that we have a lot of acreage here. We have a lot of space. We're also very spread out. And it does become a challenge when you start talking about, you know, what goes near what and who's near to this and all of these things. And I think that the design team and others really put a lot of thought and really came up with a good solution to be able to say, we recognize that given the challenges of our campus, we can solve some of those accessibility and access issues for a wide variety of our students. Um, specific to uh, GED and international students, building 11 is probably one of the closer buildings to this entire area being situated there by where building 12 is. And I think that at the end of the day, the walk from building 11 to the iTech building is gonna be greatly beautified by a lot of the things that this project is addressing. Awesome. I have a second question yeah, if oh I, God. excellent. Um, the JTAC program, I saw that they were part of our conversations. Are they also uh, participating on campus currently? And if, uh, and in this new building, how would they uh, utilize the space? Yeah, we do have partnerships with them and, and definitely this is, is one of the spaces that we're having conversations about how we can share it in a variety of ways. Um, as I mentioned before, a, a, a large number of programming in this space we're hoping will be used by our apprenticeship programs. Many of our apprenticeship programs meet in the evening, which gives us opportunities to use some of these spaces during the daytime with other partners and for other learning activities. And so I know I'm really looking at this building as if you're here in the evenings or in the daytime, you're probably gonna see a significant amount of activity taking place in here. Great, thank you. So um, you mentioned the industry 4.0 in terms of programming. And you know, one thing I think we see 
um, is frequent development and changes in the needs that our industry partners have. And I'm just curious about the flexibility of programming, the flexibility of space. How are we going to be thinking about that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. This has been a pretty much an an everyday conversation as we've talked about this building. You know, from the very beginning, we've talked with our architects and, and others about making sure that this space has the um, is built with flexibility in mind. Um, and so the design principle that has been moving forward from the very beginning is around flexibility. This is also one of the reasons why we've talked with our national partners about what what are what would be the ideal space um, ratios? What 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 type of um, programming as far as space do we need in the building in order to be flexible moving into the future to accommodate partners like Laney SD to accommodate new uh, technologies or new programming that's coming in. And that's why we've had a lot of conversations about is this sized correctly? Is this sized appropriately? Are we building it in such a way that allows for this flexibility? At the end of the day, we are going to end up with a building that is exactly that flexible um, from, you know, from two perspectives, I would say. One, right off the get-go, we're designing it in such a way that for each of the areas that are in each of the spaces, they will have a level of flexibility that in the near future, they'll be able to accommodate and make changes to their teaching within the space that they're in. And second of all, the design principle of the building overall allows us for modest investments to make significant changes to the look of the interior of the building to accommodate programs that might be growing or shrinking or otherwise changing over a longer term perspective. Great, thank you. Angela and then Steve and then Rosie. Thank you. Um, really great presentation. Thank you, Grant. Um, I'm wondering about there are a couple of spots in the executive summary that talk about marketing and like making sure that folks know about these programs so that we can actually get the enrollment that we want to see in them. And I'm wondering what sort of plans we have and if there's like plans to work with our industry partners to like skill up their existing employees or you know how are we gonna, how are we going to fill those seats? Yeah. Um, so. Marketing is something that we've had uh, brief conversations about at this point in time. We do have a new marketing director actually uh, um, um, that, that has come on in the, in the last several months or in the last year or so. And we've started to have conversations with marketing about what our plan is, right? You know, what is the right timing to um, advertise for specific programs? And at, marketing has indicated a great interest in doing not just broad institutional marketing, but also specific program <clears throat> focus areas. And so we will be working with marketing as the building comes online, as we're looking at programs to be able to promote them in that way. We also have had conversations with um, business partners about how they market. You know, a great example of that, that that isn't necessarily exactly related to the building, but is for these areas, is Diesel Days that happened recently. Um, that event was largely sponsored and advertised by our transportation sector partners. Um, and they, they did a, a phenomenal job with that. This same group of transportation sector is, is looking at helping us um, with marketing of other training elements that we have and doing. And I foresee a very similar thing within the programs that are in the iTech building. We have industry partners in each of those areas that will be very interested in helping us market. And also we have started to have conversations with um, some of those same partners about how we um, design our curriculum in such a way that we can do skilling up opportunities. That's a major focus area that we have is looking at our curriculums and not just updating the space in which they're located, but also updating our curriculum within that space to be able to accommodate some of those need, those changing needs such as focused air, skill areas that are for skilling up versus full complete certificate programs or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Steve and then Rosie, or you can go to Rosie goes first. Great, thank you, Steve. Rosie? Oh, thanks. Um, I, I actually have kind of a couple questions. One, one is we've been hearing that the scope and scale of this project was starting to sort of get away from us to some extent. Um, 
So my reaction to your wonderful presentation, really great job. It is, it's not just an opportunity for the foundation, it's an imperative <laughs> for our foundation, but, but it's made in the shade for the foundation to be wildly successful working with that sector of, of uh, community partners in our district. <clears throat> so, so I'm optimistic that um, our leadership is moving ahead adroitly in, in, that, in that respect. Um, my question is, what are, there, what are the opportunities for us to go back to the well at the state and get some matching funds for this uh, bricks and mortar project. I mean, we, we, we've already achieved our match for the new health building, but by the time we go to break ground on this, we should have cycled back around and been able to go back to the state again, shouldn't we? So as, as the state opportunities come up for capital funding, you know, we will look at prioritization. I think that when we look at <clears throat> this particular building project, um, that's one of the reasons why we're looking at, you know, what can the bonds support and then what can we go back to others to support as far as equipment and otherwise, because timing wise, this building is, is moving forward on, on a schedule that doesn't align with the additional state funding in that way. What it does align with is our opportunities to use other funding sources, including donors that we have, such as Perkins funding or, or others. Um, to, to look at how we can move the programs forward in that aspect. Um, what I do look at, though, is this idea of the CTE district, right? And as additional state funding comes up through um, some of these capital grants that, that are out there and, and come forward, I would look at continuing to build out that CTE district and really make improvements in our Building 9 for our transportation technologies uh, programs and really look at how then those programs can benefit from some some um, investment as well. So I don't know about the rest of you, but listening to KLCC on the way out here this evening, heard the story about the many, many, many millions of dollars exceeding state economists projections that are going into state tax coffers right now, projecting giant, giant um, kicker um, wish it wouldn't kick, wish they'd put it in the rainy day fund and give it to us to build buildings with. But I mean, the timing couldn't be better for us to be talking to our delegation, which we're also working on. Maybe a campaign for a kicker donation to the foundation, right? Yeah, really. Yeah. Steve? Yeah, um, two questions. One specific about the, uh, the drone um, program. So I just wanted to get a little more clarity. Was That's a program designed to train people to work in um, companies that are that are building, manufacturing those things from scratch. It's not about the piloting of, but the, the design and construction of, of, of drones. So, you know, that's a really exciting area that is changing daily. Um, when we first started the drone program or the UAS program, it really was about piloting and really focused on the piloting aspect of, of the profession or the area. Um, as we look and as, have, as we've projected forward over where the industry is going over the next five to 10 years, it's really moving in a direction of technician and manufacturing rather than strictly piloting. So the piloting aspect of the program will remain a core outcome because our, our students will need to know how to operate. They will have to be operators and operate those systems. But we're moving the curriculum in a direction that allows them to become technicians who understand the aerodynamics, understand the electrical systems, understand the, the, the energy storage, understand the motors and the wiring, the harnessing and all of that, and will be able to build and maintain those um, flight systems. Because as they enter the industry, whether they're an operator and pretty much strictly an operator or whether they are a technician working on manufacturing or other things, the operators will frequently have um, parts that break and systems that get destroyed and have to repair them on site. I had a great, great conversation with our, our UAS instructor a couple of days ago that's been talking to his industry partners about mobile units that they have that go out and print parts on site 
while they're there with the units to try and make the repairs and do everything. And so this is the exciting area that we're moving into with this is how our students become operators and technicians with these systems. I can just tell you as the father of a kid who has his own drone, the number of times we have had to, you know, MacGyver the thing on. <laughs> the three, three so. of my four kids are saying they want to join that program. Oh, so. I, I, I do, I, I do as well. Uh, so, anyways, I think that's great. I'm super excited about it. My other question, completely different. Um, what evidence is there, or can, can we go out and find, perhaps from Chemeketa or PCC? Um, regarding sort of the, once we make this investment or, you know, and, and we build this building, is there any evidence out there that shows industry moving into the area as a result? I don't, it sounds like you don't have an answer or maybe you don't <laughs> off the top of your head. I would like us to find, I would like us to be looking into that. It's something we should be able to, if there is evidence out there, our community would like to hear about it. Marge? So within weeks that I arrived, the phone call started to come from uh, people who had to say they were anonymous because they were looking for the site of where to put their new plant from the chambers. And all of the questions were the same. Do you have the capacity to train these workers now, today, in six months, a year from now? So I think that's going to continue um, and, and actually we, I had to be very honest with what our capacity was at the time. Of course, we always want to say yes, but I'd have to say yes, but so I'm pretty confident that once word gets out that we have these types of facilities and, and the key was you heard him say flexible, because if you've got something flexible, these skills are transferable, you know, manufacturing has moved away from one type of manufacturing. Now it's niche manufacturing. It's specific to your company and your company and your company. And that's what he's going to do. We're going to, we're going to teach the core skills. And that means they can bring in whatever widget they're making and they could probably transfer it and we can train it. So I don't have hard data. I can tell you though, literally weeks from when I first arrived, I was getting phone calls from all over at a state even that wanting to know specifically, would we have the capacity to train this specific type of worker? Yeah. So it's going on. I, I expect constantly. it's out there. I'm just thinking as a taxpayer, right? Well, yeah. what do I want to what do I want to hear from Lane Community College about this investment we've made? Like I want to know the building's going up. I want to know that my kid and your kid and every other kid who's interested in this kind of thing has that opportunity to go. I also want to know that they have to and get the instruction and all that. I also want to know that um, they have the opportunity to stay in the Eugene Springfield, whatever Lane County area um, to work. And that potentially that investment is bringing in additional investments in terms of corporate companies or whatever. Steve, we have one. some data about yeah, so, our students who stay here. Yeah. So we, the we know of it, some of that. Yeah. So the, anyways, the more of that anecdotally, even if that's the best we could do is, yeah. I think is useful. And, and uh, I was silent there for a minute because I had to think of, of, of some of, of some of the examples. Um, I, I do have a couple of examples that, that I think begin to answer that question, even though I don't have, <clears throat> you know, a report right in front of me that says on average across the United States, this is what happens. But, you know, Jeff Wyko with Wake Technical Community College, who was one of our consultants with NCATC, um, Wake Technical College invested in their industry 4.0 manufacturing and is now doing the apprenticeship training for Amazon for their, their plants and other things. So they bring in students to do that training and are, are, are doing that for then the industry that is in that area. When I went and visited Pima Community College and talked to them, they invested a, um, several years ago as a consortia in, in the Pima County area and, and around in um, automation mechatronics. And they expected to get five or 10 students. And within a year of building the program, they had demand out the door because they had industries who were coming in and saying, we need these trainings, we need these things. And their industry has grown since then as, as it's there. Now, those are th those are links to to some of our partners in in education that have experienced that from the enrollment standpoint and the demand standpoint on training in their areas as they've seen those areas grow. So those are yeah. those are the two that I know of. So I'm gonna go. Oh, Paul. Yeah. And then just, just one back. second, Paul. Can I just? I'm gonna go to Mike next, and um, we are at almost 30, 30 minutes just over 30 minutes for this topic. And so 
I'm gonna encourage people to send additional questions to Grant and Marge. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Thank you, and I'll be quick. The interesting thing that this provides is that, you know, this will be showcased in our area chamber communications, right, for recruiting and as a tool to have, you know, nice glossy photos of, of good space and good training space. The other thing I think it's important to keep in mind is that, you know, we are a small business entrepreneurial environment around here with adjacent to the U of O and with night campus coming on that this will show that, you know, proof of concept can occur, but we can also move into manufacturing right locally. And so businesses can grow and stay that are developed here in the area can grow and stay in here because we provide a well-trained workforce. Yeah. So I think, it, I think it's aligned pretty well and it's pretty timely. I think it's just so great. Good job. Mike. Thank you, Grant. Good job. Um, as we've wrestled with budget problems, we've uh, increasingly become aware that some of our programs cost more to operate than other programs. And sometimes it's our high demand programs that are the most costly to operate. Um, how do, uh, is that gonna be a problem for us with, with uh, these things? I, if, if we have a program that's so popular that it, we do have people lined up out the door, but it's costing us more per student to operate it than what we're bringing in, that's gonna put a drain on us somewhere. So, you know, this, this question, I think, Mike, really speaks to the way Oregon funds uh, community colleges and particularly how we fund career technical education in the state. Um, there isn't the recognition that needs to be around the true cost of training for these high demand areas. I think that as we look as an institution, um, yes, our high demand areas in career technical education traditionally cost more as an institution but what they provide to our community as far as workforce development and um, economic growth for our students and the pathways that they provide to a, a huge variety of students in our population really speak to our mission of why we're here and what we're doing to improve their lives as students. So that really speaks to a need for us to be um, making people aware that as we are increasing this capacity, there's another side of that that is going to require support. Yes. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Grant. Right. Thank you, everyone. Exciting. <laughs> All right. So let's go on to um, collaboration with City of Eugene on the Mary Spilby Center. Marge? Okay. Thank you. So uh, our Mary Spilby <clears throat> Center has had several tenants over the past couple of years, and the city was in a significant need for space about a year and a half ago and they asked if they could uh, take over a couple of spaces and see how it was working. Uh, it turns out it worked fabulous for them. Uh, the space was was in a good location. It had all the uh, amenities that it needed. Uh, they actually partnered with us. They built out a beautiful boardroom space there. They're having their meetings there. So we're looking at our lease. And it was a short-term lease. So came in December of 2020 during the pandemic. The lease is up 2023. And I think it's time to get a temperature feel from you all. Um, you know, we're getting a fairly stable revenue from this from the city. Uh, it's a good partner, you know, uh, government and education go hand in hand. Having folks coming in and out of the building, there's been no issues. And I'd like to get your feedback about prolonging the lease because they have voice that they need to have uh, long-term plans on what they would, uh, where they will be able to stay. So they have been starting conversations with uh, myself, uh, Vice President Stalliard, um, our attorney, to see what the future could possibly look like looking at long-term lease options. Yeah. Were you finished, Marge? I've got Mike and then Austin, thank you. So um, I am just wondering about uh, our potential need for the space. Uh, you know, if, if, first of all, I like the idea a lot. It's, it's great to have space, it's prime space because of its location. And it's, it's wonderful to have it uh, be sought after and put to good use. Uh, but I'm wondering if what our, our future needs are. So we've been through just about 
Paul, I really should have Paul address this one, but we've tried lots of different things, at least I know prior to my coming and then since I've coming. And if, if you looked at that first line in the background, the intention, I went back to look at the original documents was to uh, almost do a little <clears throat> bit of what Grant's talking about, have more, be more of a business incubator situation. It never, it never, it just didn't happen. Uh, there were other opportunities to do other things in the town. What actually did happen though, was ESL, ABSC, DevEd, it became a center for that uh, GED uh, education. So that's a good thing because you're an urban center and you want to serve your folks. But that was the biggest area that it flourished in. Now, because it was so much space, we we were only using about 50% when I got here. Jennifer's here. She could address it. She did a lot of utilization studies for me. Uh, I would walk very empty halls. And of course, people spread out because they had the space. So we do have a lot of space. However, we don't want to take away from those academic areas that could still use that. So within these lease uh, parameters, we could uh, look at keeping a whole floor. We could look at keeping certain classrooms. All that's on the table. Great. The, their biggest questions to us is, what do you need? And then could we centralize it more? You know, we do a lot of odd things there because, you know, we have everything from massage therapy gone over here. We got the child care center over here. We're spread out because it's like we live in this big palace, um, but we could certainly be more centralized. Well, I like the idea. Um, Austin. Yeah, I'm in full support of this, um, especially with the collaborative use of the space uh, with the city. And uh, as you were kind of mentioning there with the dynamics that we can uh uh, have further conversations with the city about. So yeah, I'm in full support of it. And I look forward to uh, how those conversations go of um, the use of the space. So thank you for bringing this to our attention. Holly? I agree, I'm in full support. Um, I think with our collaborative efforts, we can pump it up a little bit more and, and help each other bring people into the space, you know, not using that, but programs, but. Are you done, Holly? Steve? Uh, oh, it sounds good to me also. I guess um, what I'm mostly interested in, honestly, this isn't going to sound good, uh, is the revenue. Um, I, I'm less interested in who the tenant is. Uh, you know, I like them to be law abiding, but that's about, that's my chief requirement <laughs> there. The city will do, I guess. But uh, um, do you think that that's sort of our highest and best opportunity for revenue? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're good for it. <laughs> not no, that they're not that they're no, of course teasing, they're good not in that they, regard they, but is there are... somebody else that would say hey that space is even more valuable to us um and we would pay more for it so you have to be careful because we originally bought this building and i have our folks here our experts here but when you buy when you use uh, taxpayer monies i don't think you can just do anything you want there there's limitations greg can you address that better than i no, that's good. okay there's limitations oh, okay. So a government entity and education, that's why we've been dealing with 4J. 4J's needs are temporary. Um, they're there, but they're building other spaces and they'll eventually be leaving us. So honestly, I, I think they are um, a wise choice for us. Yeah. Rosie? Yeah, I, I have a little bit different perspective from yours, Steve, because I, I was just joining the board when the board was putting the spade in the ground and taking pictures and carrying on and breaking ground for that building. And the history is that the city sold LCC that pit for a buck. And so, and the city then proceeded to put $8 million in urban renewal money into the project. Didn't have to do that, did. So I feel like we have a responsibility as good partners uh, to to give the city all possible consideration. Um, obviously they're not asking for any special favors and they haven't along the way. So I, I'm very supportive of the direction this is taking and have hopes that it will. Well, now I wish Lisa would have called on you first and me second, I would have <laughs> modified my comments. <laughs> Hearing I, that, I just but, want to say, hearing always, that does actually it does affect me. Of course, that yeah, makes a lot of I sense. I've just yeah. always felt like we we have we have had an, a spectacular partner in the city of Eugene when it comes to the 
to that building downtown. And so I just feel like we have a responsibility. I'm, to I'm with you 100%. I was not aware of the history. Thank yeah. you. Okay, then with that in mind, we will continue discussing what are, again, um, Michael Blade is involved with looking at what kind of lease options uh, we could have. And as discussions continue, we'll bring to you where it looks like they, um, they'd be interested in. They have to have similar conversations at council level. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Let's move on to, <clears throat> excuse me, bond update from Capital Construction Manager, Tom Goodhue and Facilities Director, Jennifer Hayward. <clears throat> no, I don't, thanks for the bond. Uh, thank you, I'll, I'll keep my comments fairly brief. You provided things, Jennifer's here to talk about the diversity, equity and inclusion piece. We'll probably break this into two parts to do that. Um, update, I'm gonna focus on scope, schedule and budget. Um, kind of key things in it. Uh, scope, you had a great presentation from Grant. So you're, I think, starting to understand what we're trying to do with the ITAC building. Um, I think we're still trying to figure out what we're doing with it somewhat, but uh, it, it is an exciting project. So that one's moving forward. Uh, health professions, again, we're, still struggling while well, we're getting close to permits. We're, we're trying to refine that, that scope, uh, mm -hmm. doing the last minute tweaks as we meet with faculty that are trying to teach in the space. Um, that's going along. And of course, Florence is underway, under construction. And that's, you know, in a pretty happy place there. So that's my, my scope discussion. Working pretty well. Uh, project schedules. Everybody claims that we're on track for the, the schedules where we're at here. I will say as we get into buyouts, we're, we're currently in the buyout process for uh, Florence. And as we get in there, our trade partners are coming back and going, yeah, I can't get, you know, they're telling us the manufacturers are a year out for electrical parts. Um, Working on it, we'll, we'll see where that is. It's, uh, we can't, you know, trying to get the right answers. We're, we're out there trying to buy things ahead. Um, so as much as everybody thinks all of these projects are on schedule, the world is wonky. I'll just leave it there. Um, so that's my, my project schedule. Um, project budgets, I think, a little wonky again, but we're, we're focusing it. I really have great teams on all the projects to, to help guide us in decisions. Um, every decision, I, we, Grant and I just came from a meeting with health professions and again, just trying to get the refinements and being very conscious of you know, both what materials are available as well as what the impacts to, to cost are. So that's there. I, I think the budgets that we've, we're at now are, pretty good knock on wood here uh we're you know that the market is strange i i i would have if the year would have go when i came here if you would have said we had 30 to 50 percent inflation i would have been i was laughing at that kind of an idea at this point and it just doesn't seem to stop so um those are the challenges um wish it was all rosy and wonderful news but it's the reality where we're going on, we're going to focus on these three projects overall, some smaller projects. And then as we get these pinned down, we'll go back and look at things. I do want to touch base one of the next projects. Our next capital application is for the math science building. So we did just submit a, a grant request on that. So that's one of the things that's in our mix. Um, and that was a $24 million project proposal asking for $8 million from the state with our lobbying groups trying to see if they can squeeze a couple more dollars out of that than 8 million based on some of that other information. But uh, so, so that is the one and that was in Grant's defense. You know, we, we did think about doing it, but the way the grant process works, we didn't wanna wait to understand that because they do, they actually, want to be at the front end of a project and not come in into an active project. So hopefully that helps you there. With that, I'll. Got Austin in the queue. 
Hi there. First off, uh, thank you. And I can only imagine the uh, difficulties with uh, supply chain, labor, uh, costs in general. So I just I want to empathize with you uh, greatly in that area. Um, a question I have in regards to what was the original timeline for the Florence Center? Florence Center, we were looking to be done by uh, December. And okay. currently we, we adjusted things. Uh, Russ, who runs the center out there, he said, let's do some things so they could start at spring break, this past spring break, and get started earlier. So our, our contractor jumped through some hoops, was able to get in there earlier. Um, that's why we're, we've got most of the demolition done and we're, we're starting getting towards some reconstruction. So the hope is still that we'll get in for a large part by fall, um, but there, there'll probably be a few things that'll drag on um, as we move in, just to knowing that there are some challenges out there with some switch gear and Absolutely. We're, we're, we're still working on it. I'm, I'm not giving up. Totally, totally. I have a second question about scope, but- um, Go for it. This okay. Um, so um, the I've been looking at grants uh, through uh, commerce uh, department in regards to like, like rural campuses and stuff like that. And I was wondering, like if we were to, especially with like bond dollars and stuff, if we were to apply for and get a grant uh, for something specific, like for a campus like Florence or for the iTech mm -hmm. building or for something like that, how does that work exactly with the dynamics? Like, is it like, um, oh, and inf cost inflation has gone up, thus we could use this grant to help with, you know, mitigating that. Or is it kind of like, yeah, well, how does that work with the um, uh, the bond dollars? Well, I'll, I'll try this and Greg may want, but essentially it's it's more cash in our pocket uh, that we can use. The, the bond dollars said we had to address things. Um, mm -hmm. We can bring in matching funds. Uh, Florence, we have state seismic funds that are matching yep. there. Health professions, we have eight million in the state grant. You know, that's mm -hmm. we're leveraging the next state grant for the science. If we get other funds in, it backfills that that pocket. You know, we we're getting some rebates off of some things that are not big dollars, but those go essentially refund into that kitty that helps stretch every penny. And so if you got ideas, let's talk. Cool. March. Yeah, this, there has never been a better time to invest in your grants department. <laughs> and that is definitely higher on our list because the grants are going to fly in, as you said, those federal grants are going to fly in so fast that they're going to give you maybe at best 30 days if you're lucky. So yeah. we are gearing up right now because once those apps come in, you got to have somebody that literally locks themselves in a room and <laughs> completes the forms. So yes, cash in hand help us not only finish the project, but maybe add some enhancements that we yeah. thought we didn't, couldn't afford. Absolutely. But again, great work with everything. Thank you. I have myself in the queue. Um, I'll keep an eye out if anybody else has a question or comment. Tom, um, it sounds like we're, we're getting to most of our, our big, you know, the big kind of sexy projects that we identified in the bond. I'm curious about deferred maintenance because that is something that is an ongoing expense and it tends to drain our general fund. Well, Florence was, there's a seismic grant, which whether that's deferred maintenance or not is, was a, a big part of it. But the other thing, we're replacing the electrical system, the mechanical systems, the plumbing system, upgrading finishes. So that's, you know, it's, it's addressing 75 to 80% of the deferred maintenance there. Right. You know, we're tearing down building a good chunk of building 12 because that was so much deferred maintenance. And that's why we keep, I'm holding on desperately to make sure that happens. Um, so th there's big things. Yeah. There's also, yeah, we we're working on other projects, you know, that are from controls for the HVC. You know, we've, actually been a little bit lucky that we haven't had to use bond dollars with some of our HVAC stuff that uh, some of the COVID money came in. We're through campus funds. We're studying some of the raised platforms around center building, which we now trying to decide whether, what the needs are there. So we haven't given up on it and we're, we're working on scoping them, trying to decide which ones are the highest priority, which, you know, we, 
we're doing parking lots. Um, that, that'll, you'll be getting a couple of contracts on that very soon for this summer's work. Uh, but we haven't forgotten about it, trust me. Rosie? Could we get an update at some future meeting about the oh, myself and yeah. Rosie? <laughs> yeah. I'd be glad to do that. We'll, we'll get there. It's <laughs> And I, I guess I would also be interested in what are the things on our that we identified as part of the bond that we might potentially not be able to do. That's, and I, I yeah. don't need that right now because yeah. I know there's a it, it's a period of time, but I would hope that those issues come to the board early and and that they don't come to us after there's yeah. upset about it. Me too. Thanks, Tom. Anyone else? March. That was really a, a good point. Yeah. I wonder if maybe part of the report out, maybe once a year or semi, you know, we could say if things went along the way they are today, maybe we wouldn't get to number nine or 10, but that will change. That's why I know Tom would be hesitant because it's going to change as things change, but maybe some sort of an annual reporting or quarterly, whatever you all feel comfortable with, and we could let you know if nothing else changed, we would or wouldn't get to X or Y or Z. Would that be fair? Yeah, we can work towards that. And I mean, anytime we can get some grants, all of those things. Yeah, I, I think that's imperative. <clears throat> that is exactly the role of the bond oversight committee. Their charge is to verify whether the board is doing what it said it would do with the bond money. So if there is the possibility that we anticipate some, some inability based on market conditions, the economy, et cetera, forecasting that early is the best thing we could possibly do. Having said that, I'm really not interested in making more work out of this than we need to. So to quarterly feels radically overkill to me. I mean, th these things are just not going to um, shift and change that much unless you decide that they are, and then you can alert <laughs> us. I mean, you can tell us. But I, I don't want to set up an expectation that we want to hear on a, on a basis that is unnaturally frequent. If I may suggest then the bond, the bond oversight committee reports to you once a year and they are preparing their report as they speak. We can talk to them and suggest yeah. and actually re request to make sure that that's part of the bond, the bond report. Okay. Great. The, um, the bond oversight committee asked us to prepare a summary of what we're doing for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the bond. And we just thought you guys might like to see it. <laughs> it's included in your packet and I'll just spend a couple minutes going over it. Um, the, the three big projects that Tom talked about tonight, Florence Health Professions and iTech are all being done using the CMGC construction manager, general contractor contracting method. And with that method, um, you know, we've mentioned this before, we have a lot more flexibility in requiring contractors to do things like include um, diversity and subcontractors and um, use local, local contractors and things like that. So, um, with um, and when we do the community or the CMGC process, we put out a request for proposal, um, and then we select companies based on the qualifications rather than um, just based on a hard bid. And we uh, asked them in their request for proposal to address the community benefits agreement and um, talk about how they will support that and implement it. So um, at the end of the packet are the, the two contractors that we've hired so far to do um, the Florence Center and um, the health professions in iTech, Fortis Construction and Lease, Crutcher Lewis. I included uh, the information that they submitted on how they would implement the community benefits agreement. They were scored on these and they both companies scored highly. That's part of the reason why they were selected. Um, and so you can, you can look at their plans for implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies, which I think are really aggressive. Um, 
and and I am confident that they will do them and be successful. Um, one example, a, a recent project that we just wrapped up with Fortis Construction was our Building 19 seismic project. That was about a $2.5 million project using the CMGC process. And they were able to um, have 33% of the subcontractor funds spent were to um, minority women-owned businesses. So it's, um, it's good. <laughs> so we hope to continue that trend with our other bigger projects. So that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Lots of <laughs> thumbs up here for people who weren't able to see that. And I have Steve followed by myself in the queue. Holly, did you want to get in the queue? Okay, so Steve will go to Holly and then me. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you for the uh, report back. So I know at the University of Oregon, I'm kind of close to some of this, these kinds of issues. We have, they have written into the contracts that the contractor must submit a, you know, a report at the end of the project that says, here's the number of historically underutilized businesses, which right includes women-owned, minority-owned, veteran-owned. Yeah. There's, a few, con there's yeah. a few other categories, I think. Um, so that, you know, just to make it easy for um, for us, the university or you, the, the community college to sort of keep track of what what those what that looks like in terms of dollars, in terms of number of people employed, in terms of number of companies uh, subcontracted. It's just a simple way that the University of Oregon has kind of followed up on the, a similar kind of request. I'm wondering, do you have that written into contracts? Yeah. Yes. And and in fact, we have written into the contract. They have to report on all of the the CBA goal, so including um, local products and local businesses also. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. The, the report out is, to me, is sort of everything. Like mm -hmm. now there's all this promise and all that and they try, but okay, what did you actually yeah. achieve? It matters a lot. Yeah. Holly? Actually, I don't have a whole bunch to say here. Thank you for this report. I'm just looking for the area. You said at the end of the report, there was a list of the companies and I don't see what page. Oh, tell me what page yes, is. sorry, um, let's see. Page, starting on page three, so this was what Fortis uh, Construction submitted um, their their description of how they would implement the community benefits goals if we hired them, and we did hire them, and that's what they're doing. And then a few pages later is the lease Crutcher Lewis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, so you probably recall when we first started discussing the CBA. Um, some of us wanted to set goals and there was some hesitation on the part of staff around some of these items. And um, I do remember the suggestion of the goal for women and minority owned businesses of being around 15%. And so it's really exciting to see that we've exceeded that by double, but it also makes me wonder about like, we didn't know what to set the goals at, right? So um, I'm, I'm real. I mean, that's a third. So that that's fantastic. Thank you for that work. Um, I would love to see, you know, after some of, you know, we get some of these reports, like Steve was mentioning, if we could get a sense of like, where might we set some goals? I also noticed that, um, you know, Fortis has a grading scale. I love the little like gas gauge, old fashioned gas gauge thing, the A through F, they clearly have some idea of goals that they, that they were utilizing as a standard. So um, I'm not asking for this information tonight, but I would love to be thinking about how we can set some goals for ourselves. Okay, that's good. Um, what, one thing I'll note and maybe Tom can speak to this real briefly is that I think on the Florence project, because it is rural, we will have a harder time getting the... Okay, good. good. <laughs> so can you approach a, a microphone? Actually, what I'm hearing at the Florence project, because of the nature of the location, the local businesses out there have really stepped up and want to be involved, and they fall within these types of requirements. Um, the size of the project is right for them, too. I think I, I'm more concerned when we get to the iTech building or the health professions, which are larger, more technical jobs that the competitive people are going to be in a more traditional business. I'll word it that way. Great. Well, I, I really appreciate the information and, and the efforts. Yeah, I had a chance to drive by the Florence and checking it out. It was great. And Russ has offered that. Um, 
I can probably go and visit if it's safe and he'll give me a little tour. Yeah. So it's, it's exciting to see the work happening. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that mention, Holly. Anyone else? Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our last discussion item. We have the PERS bond update. <clears throat> and I am going to guess that um, Greg Holmes is going to discuss that for us. The short That's... straw, huh? What's that? <laughs> you drew the short straw tonight there, Greg? Yeah, my boss is in Florida. <laughs> I don't know how that rates. No, I'd rather be in tells, Oregon. Tells good news. Tells good no, news. Oregon's good. Well, the news is the market is, they're forecasting our, our bonds in July to be approaching 4.8. That's above what you guys have authorized and what we recommended based on the Echo Northwest. So on Monday um, with Lane County, Lane County, us and four other school districts are in the same, same boat, right? So on Monday, Lane County and, and LCC, we went in agreement to go ahead and do an Echo Northwest. So they're updating the report. It'll be done noon on the 27th which is a Friday, right? And so our goal is always to get the information to you guys the weekend before. So that's Friday at noon. Um, we'll have to, legal will have to, uh, bond council will have to update the resolution. If that's, that'll be the option that we need to bring back. Um, so we'll bring that back along with an updated Echo Northwest, the probability, you were asking about that, Steve. Um, so we went ahead and, and funded that, right? Um, right now, it's just the two districts that have funded that, and then we're waiting on Monday next week to see if some of the school districts want to go in on the on the report itself. So we're doing that, um, and then we'll bring that resolution um, uh, for discussion next uh, on the on the first. On the fifteenth, we're still planning on coming with the different scenarios. Um, we'll run those numbers based on the TIC of anywhere between 4.8 and 5. And we'll run some different scenarios, probably the same scenarios. You know, what if we had invested at 2007 and look at some of those investing options for you, as well as a best case. So that's our plan. Do you have any questions? I'm just going to ask for a quick clarification and then we're going to go to Mike. You didn't mention a month when you said the 27th. Are you just, is that May? So it's, um, yeah. So May 27th is when the report is going to be ready. Right. And so we try to get those to the president on Wednesday, you know, that Wednesday. So it's going to be Friday when the report they'll be done at noon. And then we need to get um, that report attached to the resolution and work with um, legal to have that have them review that resolution so we'll have that in the board packet hopefully by the close of business friday when we go public so you have the weekend to review that material great mike i haven't made up my mind about this and i will certainly wait to hear what the what we get from the echo northwest but uh, Steve's words are ringing in my ears, and as we're seeing interest rates skyrocket, it's it's kind of hard for me to imagine that this is going to the, the margin for success just seems like it's narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. So that's sort of my gut reaction without without data yet. So yeah, and that's you're right. So our last one, our TIC was five point six, right? So in the two thousand and two market their total in interest costs. So um, yeah, I know it's, I, I, I try not to watch the news and I definitely don't watch my <laughs> retirement. So. There's a variety of reasons. Right? <laughs> yeah. so. Holly, Dr. Stallard's words just keep ringing in my head. <laughs> like we can't just not do anything. Yeah. Anyway. I, and that's why we invested in this report. I mean, obviously, you know, if you guys, decide not to do the resolution it, it is important to you know when we considered the cost we had to make a go or no go on monday to give them enough lead time um so marge and then we'll go to angela we we set this up for you so that you can pull out but but we're pushing it we're going to push you right to the end with information and then 
if you say pull the plug, we pull the plug. But but we are going to spend a little money and get the report for you. So you have that final before you make your decision. How much is a little money? <laughs> okay, so it's the, a little bit more than a little money. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. The, so um, this is an update. So the report came in at the quote came in at 16,500. Right. And so, you know, it's a, I think it's a closer to 20,000 or 24 when, you know, the, in January. Was that before or after we split it with the county schools? No. So we split it. So right now our, we're half of that. So Lane, Lane County is offered to do all the procurement stuff, which I kept my hand down. <laughs> and so, so they're running it through their uh, purchase order system and all their contract stuff. And then uh, we'll reimburse the county. And then hopefully if, you know, we'll see what the school districts do next week. I think Angela had a follow-up question. And that, was my that was your follow-up. Okay, great. <laughs> Steve? Uh, I, I just wanted to say, I think we're doing exactly all the things that we should do. We should walk right up to the precipice. We should have as much information as we possibly can, 16,000 or whatever the, our piece of it is, money well spent. It's exactly what we should do. Um, so I am curious, like we're still on the same timeline that we talked about before. This is not slowing us down that we're doing this additional study. No, we're working with um, the underwriter, working on the preliminary offering statement. Um, that is something I, sh oh, I should at least update you. So it's required, bond council is going to recommend that we send it out to the board members. So I, for some of you that haven't been on, we're here in August when we sold our bonds. It's, it's a. Uh, a bunch of information about Lane County, Lane County, and our districts that we operate in, and actually about the college. Um, but one of the requirements is we email that out as a final draft for your input. So that'll be another um, report that'll come probably via email. There's no action other than that we we gave our Board of Education that report. So the plan is still to bring the resolution to the board meeting on June 1st. Yeah, so that was that that's the only change in this plan was that, you know, we don't have the authority to go past 4.51. So any, any other questions or comments? Austin? Um so Interest rates obviously have an impact on this. Is there other um, elements that have an impact on it? Like how much is in our reserve fund, things like that? Thanks for talking about reserve funds. So this is it. Right. As, as we go through our budgeting, right? Reserves are very important. So, um, you know, our goal is if, if this is successful um, and we get a 2% reduction in our rates, you know, staff will recommend taking that 2% savings and putting it aside um for that opportunity um again timing matters right because you know if you look um early negative returns are hard to overcome over a 20 year so so timing of it matters i think that the question though was should we how important are the reserves so we want to say very important and we want to keep them at our board policy level at least right if not higher yeah, so I, I do think um, definitely we do have a, a board policy on our reserves. Um, I, and this one is in addition for some, you know, th there's volatility when you have a side account with the rates between, between the bienniums. And so, you know, that can impact cash flow. And we don't want to have to borrow just because, you know, a couple weird years, a couple, two years of up and down. Steve? But at least my understanding of Austin's question was that do the reserves also um, affect our bond rating? So yes, yeah, so bond, so when you're in a mooding, when you're in Moody's, right? And when you're doing those bond ratings, um, they look at your board, they look at your board policy. And if you say you have a 10% policy, they look at where you're, we call it, they call it free cash. So, you know, they wanna know, okay, they, they look at your general fund and then they wanna look at all your other funds you know, where is the general fund cash? So they call that free cash. So yes, we, we calculate and say, okay, this is how much um, money that the district has when you're, when, you're, when you're in a ratings call. But yeah, it, that does impact. And I think that's in the board policy. We talk about, you know, setting a policy so it doesn't impact um, your bond rating. 
so this crosses issues then a, a little bit, but one of our arguments then to, you know, in, in response to um, the contract issue is that we need to maintain reserves such that we can make some of these financial moves such that we free up money in the long term. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Okay, so that's our last discussion item. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to our future meeting dates. And we were just discussing that we have a June 1st board meeting followed by a June 15th work session. Um, in July, we have a board meeting that first week of July, and then we have our retreat on July 16th. And um, Rosie and I wanted to share with everyone that um, we are going to have a facilitated retreat. Um, we've been collaborating on that with um, Stephanie, um, with Dr. Bulger, our new president. And we're, um, I, we've identified somebody together with her in ACCT. Unfortunately, Jill was um, busy that weekend, but um, this woman, Dr. Cindy Mills, is going to be joining us, and um, we have met with her, and um, we're pretty excited to work with her. So she will be joining us for the July 16th retreat, which um, we're planning to have in person, and I believe we'll um, be meeting in the Longhouse. Angela. Are we uh, really set on July 16th? I'm going to be out of um, that has been on our calendar for nearly a year. Yeah. Um, so I think we are. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up related to future meeting dates is that um, there is a conference in the fall. Um, ACCT has two big conferences each year. Um, there's one in the fall and um, it's going to be in New York City and they have another in February, typically in Washington, DC. Donna had sent out that information to us a couple of times and we have two board members that are interested in attending, um, Austin and Steve. And um, I just wanted to also let Austin um, mention about an opportunity that he's been invited to do because he he does actually um, need approval, um, I think technically from the chair as representing the board to be able to, to do what he would like to do. So Austin, did you wanna talk about that? Yeah, yeah, just briefly. Yeah, essentially it's the building the bench uh, workshop um, and, um, uh, and uh, essentially helping with recruiting uh, uh, the next generation of board members and so forth. Um, I was planning on doing that at the San Diego conference, but that was canceled uh, due to, you know, COVID and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really excited to um, present this workshop. Um, there's been a lot of interest in the workshop. So, uh, yeah, just the, uh, support from the board um, in regards to that would be greatly appreciated. And, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, I'm really excited to kind of um, put it together and to uh, start the conversation about that. So, yeah. And uh, Steph, I know Stephanie Bulger will be there at the conference as well. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, so, Steve, did you still want want to go to that conference? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Because Donna is going um, for us to get that lower fee for the hotel. She needs to book that by Friday, and then she'll also um, start to work with you around travel plans for that. Yes, I'm. I'm glad. Steve, that you're making the time to do this. And Holly, I hope maybe you'll consider an ACCT conference. It's a big, it's a big ask since they're, they tend to be far away, although they do all seem to alternate coasts. So maybe if you don't go this year, maybe next year it'll be closer and it won't be such a big ask. But this came up almost immediately after I joined the board 11 years ago, I got a call, you want to go to this conference? And at that point it was in Dallas. And we, we've always had a real sensitivity at our house about um, elected officials traveling on the public dime. And so I called Dr. Spildy and I said, talk to me about board norms around travel. And her response to me was, if you can possibly go, go, because you will learn so much. And it's true. So I, you, I think you have 
a, a really great opportunity ahead of you to really, you know, jumpstart all, all that you may want to know about community college and board policy. So, yeah, maybe I'm glad you're going. Maybe next year it'll be someplace warmer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Florida, it's, you said it's in Florida, right? It, at this no, one New in New York City. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So um, I, if it pleases the board, um, I'm hoping that um, the board can provide me with some direction to allow Austin to present at this conference. So great. I have been directed and I can do that. And so Austin- It was gonna... thumbs up all around Austin. I don't know if you could see it, but it looked good. Um, so Austin, I, can you send me whatever form or whatever I'm supposed to fill out or a link to that? Okay. Um, are there- Do you want one more in there. comment? Yeah. Um, one of the things that this particular board hasn't really had the opportunity to talk about is sort of how, how we would like to craft our, our board norms around travel. One, one of the things I'm, I continue to be very personally sensitive about is, is the board modeling the behavior with respect to um, the use of public funds, taxpayer dollars, and, and for the benefit of all of our colleagues uh, in faculty and classified staff and managers about our expenditures related to travel. So perhaps maybe at our retreat, it might be something we could include a, a, a little bit of conversation about and decide kind of how we want to approach, what kind of policies we want to approach, what we've done in the past, what we could do in the future, whether we want to do anything or not. So does that make that work for you? Yeah. yeah. We actually will be taking a look at our own budget um, yeah. probably in, in June at the work session. When, when we'll also, so the last reminder is um, I've actually checked with Donna. It sounds like the majority of us have turned in our um, board evaluations. And so for those of us, myself <laughs> included, um, please try to get those to Donna soon. And um, we will also be discussing those at the, the June work session um, and then referring some of that conversation to the retreat to work on with the consultant. Austin? A uh, quick question about the retreat. Did we determine a location for the retreat? Like, is it gonna be on the main campus or? It is a, going to be in the Longhouse on the main campus. Longhouse on the main campus, thank you. Anything for the good of the order? How many um, cranes do we got, Angela? Wow. <laughs> you were busy. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> let, let, let the meeting let the meeting minutes refer. Uh, that's good. Reflect. So, anything else for the good of the order? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, this meeting is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Austin. Bye, Austin. <laughs>